Today. 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 And that's my line. <laughs> today. And so today we've got some guests here. We're talking Occupy Wall Street. And I had a little bit of back and forth again. I think Les <laughs> Leslie just wanted an excuse to be on the tel on the DTLT Today show again. Again. So we've got her on here, but Noise Professor's in here as well. And we're talking about Occupy Wall Street, which is interesting because last night at two o'clock in the morning, uh, Mayor Bloomberg issued an order for the police to go down and evict everyone from Occupy Wall Street from, uh, help me, Zuccotti Park? Zuccotti Park. Yeah. Zuccotti Park. And so they went down there, they evicted them, they, they destroyed all of the tents, threw everything away, threw away their books in their library, just basically shut it down, cleaned it out. And now there's a big issue going on in New York where they're trying to get back in and the police are actually blocking them from getting back into the park. Uh, and I made some controversial tweets this morning, or at least one, where I basically said, you know, is it wrong of them to do that when it becomes a tent city, when it becomes this situation where people are living there 24-7, eating and really occupying a public space, does the government have, and the people in that government have a right to say, you know what, this was actually a public space and not something that was meant for people to, you know, camp a campground. Well, I'll do a little bit of clarification here before we okay. bring our guests in. Zuccotti Park is not officially a public space. Okay. It's actually a what private space owned by one of the big developers in New York, Zuccotti. Okay. That was actually, that because of part of the, they screwed up on one of the buildings, they made it too high, mm -hmm. they had to actually grant public access 24-7 to that park. Okay. So they were by oh, okay. law okay. required to grant public access to the park, but ironically, it's private property. So it's okay. not technically like, <laughs> it's not taxpayer funded. Because they way. couldn't have which, even have done this in America in a public park. Right. So right. like in, uh, mm -hmm. in Washington Square Park, mm -hmm. they won't let them stay overnight. Right. So this, I won it's I almost wondered, like a loophole. Yeah, I wondered <laughs> I wondered about that because, you know, in other places that's been that's been the catch, right? You know, you can occupy in Oakland and other places, but after a certain period of time when the government says, Okay, we actually have rules about this and we let you do it long enough, they can shut them down. And I wondered how they were able to go two months without being shut down. Well, didn't they shut down Oakland last night too? Oakland was shut down a while ago. Um, okay. A lot of them have, there have been some recent ones. The one question that it raises is whether this one is going to cause more people to shut down now. Are more mayors of different cities going to feel empowered by, you know, it's done in New York, now can we shut down these other it's places? It's just funny when you say Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> mayor right. Bloomberg. The billionaire Mayor Bloomberg, that right. one, right. that's right. He shut it down sure. because the people are so concerned, especially him. <laughs> He's probably mm -hmm. feeling it monetarily. I can really relate to Bloomberg. Okay. Yeah. I think most people can. <laughs> well, here's... The three-term scumbag us, us New in York in the one percent here. Okay, so another question of mine then is, what, um, how much has this cost the taxpayers of New York? Does anyone know, like, how much the police enforcement and the, the sanitation... How much is Tim, it cost? How much taxpayers? does freedom hey. cost the government? I'm I'm playing devil's how advocate much does, today. How much did the Iraq War cost <laughs> us? I recognize that. I'm playing devil's advocate here, so. Okay, but what's your point? My my point is that I feel, and I said this on Twitter this morning, that I feel like the ideals of the Occupy movement have been sur superseded by the people who are occupying that space. And at this point, there are people there, a large majority of those people, who feel that it's more important to camp out in a space than to actually push forward a real agenda of some kind, what, whatever that be. I don't feel like they're reaching a goal of any kind. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, you know, at some point that balance flipped. And after that balance flipped, I'm all for, you know, the right to assemble and the right to protest 
and everything. But at some point, that balance flipped. And at that point, I felt, you know, okay, they have the right to shut it down. I'm actually surprised that didn't happen maybe a month ago. Yeah. This this reminds me, or I, the, I was reminded of the Bonus Army. You remember the story of the Bonus Army? No. And there was a couple of these, and this is a United States thing only, but it, but it happened a few times after the wars, after, after the, the various wars. Um, and I think the Spanish-American War was like one of the first ones where they delayed payments to the soldiers and the soldiers like were saying, all right, so where's our money? And then they occupied these places until they got their money and it, it happened again after World War One and World War Two, And the government basically came in and swept them out, swept the tents out, you know, and got rid of that kind of stuff. And, you know, this is a situation, for me, it comes down to kind of, and it, it, it may be wishy-washy to some extent, but it, it comes down to the point where, where does the o Occupy Wall Street kind of have more people on their side versus when do they start losing any kind of sympathy that they have? Um, and, and I think they're getting to the point where they've, they've reached that saturation point, where they, they can start to fall off the other side and, and start losing people and start... Um, getting people away from their cause. They're not protesting for any specific, like, grievance or, or thing that they, they, that they aren't getting from the government. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, everybody kind of knows that their, their whole idea is we're the 99%, we're not well representative, it, re well represented in, in government and, and other areas of, of economic life. Mm -hmm. um, and they made that point very well, in, in my opinion, and, and they're still looked favorably on. And, and it's almost like, okay, I don't want them to get swept out, but I would kind of like them to say, all right, we've, we've made our point, and, and we'll, we'll go to the next phase of this. Yeah. Leslie, I want to give you a chance to respond, because I know you're chatting, and we, we're not really able to see the chat that's up in the Google Hangout, but you had a lot of back and forth with me this morning, more related to this idea of, our, we talk more about the homeless as opposed to Occupy, but at this point, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. So I think some of the same things apply in terms of tent cities and things like that. So I want to give you a chance to reply and talk about some of the things that you're thinking. Well, like on the one, on the one, is it really loud over no, there? No, we can hear you. Down. We can hear you good. Okay. Um, well, on the one hand, uh, I mean, certainly you are having homeless people that are occupying that space. Um, but I mean, really, this is this is kind of a reflection of um, the difficulty that 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 they face on like a regular basis. It's not just you know like maybe in the last two months they've had the opportunity to have a somewhat stable place to stay. But um, the homeless situation aside, there's people that are down there that are that are at least it is in Occupy Montreal. There are people that are down there holding that space, not because they don't have another place to live, but because by occupying a physical space, you can you also begin to occupy like a, a, a space in conversation, a place, a place in the public discourse. And once you get ousted from that physical space, it, it becomes a lot easier to then you know, turn off the conversation to tune out those ideas that have come about over the last couple of months as a part of the Occupy Movement. I like that point a lot that Leslie's making. And actually, Leslie's point builds on something that David Harvey wrote um, recently that I think is really important to think of, this idea of discourse and public discourse. And he really attacks social media at the same time. So I think it's relevant to some of the stuff. But I'm going to read quickly. It's a paragraph, so forgive me. But this is from a David Harvey article on Occupy Wall Street. He says, for the first time, there's an explicit movement to confront the party of Wall Street and its unalloyed money power. So he's a Marxist, no two ways about it. The street in Wall Street is being occupied, oh, horror upon horrors, by others, you know, exclamation point. Spreading from city to city, the tactics of Occupy Wall Street are to take central public space, a park or a square, close to where many of the levers of power are centered, and by putting human bodies there, convert public space into political commons, a place for open discussion and debate over what the power is doing and how best to oppose its reach. This tactic, most conspicuously reanimated in the noble and ongoing struggle centered on Tahir Square in Cairo, has spread across the world. Plaza del Sol in Madrid, uh, Syntagma Square in Athens, now the steps of St. Paul's in London, as well as Wall Street itself. 
It shows us that the collective power of bodies in public space is still the most effective instrument of opposition when all other means of access are blocked. What the Hear Square showed to the world was an obvious truth, that it is bodies on the street and in the squares, not the babble of sentiments on Twitter or Facebook, that really matter. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And it's and, a really powerful frame. Okay, and so what I would say is bodies on the street can happen in one singular day. It can happen in one weekend of protest. At this point, we've seen two months, and it's less bodies on the street and more massive amounts of tents stuck into a park. Like, if you look... I if, mean, there's almost like this argument going on about cleanliness. Like, we need yeah. to clean everything. I mean, it's like, really? I, I, I've it's heard... this weird I've, idea of cleanliness and control well, that's coming through rather than anything about the, poli the body politic that's on the street and what they're on the street for. And... Here's, you know, I've heard that there are some Occupy places that are just as clean as can be and others where they had real problems with it. So I think that depends on what city you're in and the people behind the movement. But as a whole, I think the movement has been careful about making it a safe, clean environment, no alcohol, no drugs. So, so they did good in that respect. I, my thing is not so much in terms of cleanliness of the space, but where do... Where does the rest of the public... Okay, th so they say that they're the 99%, but in realistic terms, the rest of the public gets no say in that. So you decide that you get to occupy a public park or space, and you're using it for your political means. So no longer do I get to walk my dog there. No longer do I get to take my child there and enjoy, you know, walking along, along the road there. You've occupied that space. I am okay with that for as a means of assembly, as a means of sending out a message. I'm not okay with you setting up a tent and redefining that space itself. You know, Leslie said something earlier this morning about what if as a ukulele player I wanted to play in a park? Why shouldn't I be allowed to do that? And I think you should. What I don't think you should be allowed to do is set up permanent infrastructure, a stage, a, an arena, and say that this is what my movement, this is defining who I am and what I want to do, and as a public space, I should be allowed to do this. At some point, your rights are superseded by the rights of the whole, and I'm not so sure at this point that the rights of the people in the Occupy movement are aligned, or that the goals of the Occupy movement are aligned with the goals of the public people. Now, maybe Zuccotti Park is not the same in that respect as some other places, uh, you know, where you say that, like, maybe it's just a park that's owned by a private institution, but just this idea that you can take this, realistically, a public space, and in some cases, some really beautiful spaces, some public parks and areas that were meant for one purpose, and redefine the, the meaning and reason for them on an ongoing basis for two months or more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down to the, to the practical question again. Um, at, at some point, what would be the thing that the, the people demonstrating say, okay, we've got this and we'll leave? Because obviously they can't stay there for years upon years. I mean, I mean, and you, and there's the argument of you know, how long they can stay and, and, yeah. and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, none of these other places that you mentioned, you know, did they, are they still there 10 years later or whatever? That's so right. at what point do the Occupy Wall Street people say, okay, we got what we want and we're going to leave now? What would that thing be that they get? Is it, you know, is it, you know, we just had elections during this, this period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nothing there indicates that there's any kind of change that's going to happen. So, so what is it that they would get? Um, and I just, like I say, I, I think that but, they start to they start to get to a point where nothing has happened. And the other the other point in there is is this idea of the of the public square. We don't have these designated, um, you know, like back in the revolutionary days. It, it used to be you know Faneuil Hall, yeah. um, or or other places where people would go to protest their issues. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't really we ha we don't none of those spaces are set up anymore. And that's right. Um, we don't do enough protesting, in, in my opinion. Um, we do it in Washington in various places, and that stuff happens, you know, that's our, that's our backyard. Well, the, the argument that you could make there is that <laughs> when the government defines these, these allocated spaces for protesting, yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's usually out of, out of the public's eye. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you've got, those, you've got your free speech sure. zones in certain areas, and they sure. make quite sure that, you know, you're not disturbing the real people by, well, you know, what you're all, doing. It's there. also apparent that the powers that be... And that there is power. 
there is a uh, there is a class war going on. Mm -hmm. It is a class war of money. Mm -hmm. It's a class war of power. And this class war is actually defining <clears throat> public space so that people can aggregate and have a discourse around so many of the things. So, you know, whether or not it's about cleanliness or I wish me and my kid could go to the park and without these goddamn scumbags and all the tents, <laughs> it's about the idea that there is not right now an apparatus publicly mm -hmm. through our system to protest some of the injustices that mm -hmm. have been systematized. Mm -hmm. And that's what Occupy Wall Street is. Sure. And so I would hope that, you know, when you see Mayor Bloomberg and the police come in there or any other city and basically say, it's time to claim up, kids, that you'd understand that, yes, maybe they need to articulate what the want, but one of the greatest things about Occupy Wall Street is the refusal to articu articulate sure. what they want. Sure. But at the same time, it's like, it's just the very example that Bloomberg and them are going to come in and they're going to, you know, dictate the means of this relationship again. And then public discourse, like um, Leslie said, kind of disappears as that public space um, is cleaned up and sent back to normal so that the bankers can have their coffee there in the morning. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's <laughs> problematic. None of our problems go away. Yeah. Anything to add, Leslie? Sorry, I'm trying to come in when there's uh, not conversation. Please, That's by fine. all means, yeah, jump in. Um, well, one of the things that I'm wondering is, like, Timmy, don't you like Tim? Don't you like going camping at all? Like, do you have something against tents, <laughs> like, on a fundamental level? Because, um, and and really, one of the things that we're talking about is we're kind of arguing this aesthetic over, you know, um, kind of debating some of the really glaring injustices that we have built into our system and like if if a public park for me if it's being taken over by you know people who are willing to sleep i mean it's starting to get really, really cold here and even the first weekend of occupy montreal it was a blustery bitter cold weekend but there were people out there setting up their tents and staking them down and and you know investing um their own bodies into this you know into this movement right and uh, like I, I, I don't know. I guess the, because people aren't actually restricting you from using the park, it is being used in a different way. True. Um, I don't know about New York, but in Montreal, there are lots of other parks that people could go to that are not like actually. There's like another park that's just down the block from um, the Square Victoria or People's Place, as it's now being called. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It just seems. It, it seems like nobody's hurting anyone down there. And so why don't we allow them to continue to be there? And in terms of the ukulele thing, right? Like, there are people who don't like <laughs> ukulele. It's Imagine, an aesthetic right? thing. But th th there are people that, do, that their aesthetic is not, you know, is not ukulele friendly. And so then I become, you know, I have to be wary about where I'm sharing you know, my own expression of myself in a public space as well, right? Like, I well, I I hate camping, <laughs> but but I'll try not to have that flavor my uh, <laughs> opinions of tents too much. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, from the pictures that I've seen from New York City, your your argument in terms of there are other parks available, I I guess that's okay, except for the the logistical aspect of if it's okay for Occupy Wall Street to take this park, is it okay for this political movement to take this one? Is it okay for this nonprofit to own this other park and do their thing here, and everybody sets up tents? I, uh, you know, I here's when I talk to people, especially like you know conservative people who aren't for whatever reason fans of this movement and that blows my mind too because it's sort of like they're out there fighting for your free speech rights and why wouldn't you support a movement like that w meanwhile talking about these tea party aspects of fighting the government and go back to the basics and that kind of thing so there's that weird dichotomy there but I talk to people that are conservatives about that and they go oh those stupid Occupy Wall Street people why won't they just go away and when you question them about it I, I think if it had just been this weekend thing where you know there was this massive amount of protest, huge numbers clearly happened all over the world, and it, it didn't happen that way. It's sort of been this rollout thing, as other people have been inspired by it, which is great as well. 
But I feel like if it had just been that short period of time, then people would have gone, I see what they're saying. And like you said, what's the next step? Mm -hmm. It hasn't been that way. It's been two months. And at some point, you either decide that you're going to fight for the right for that to remain a public space, and you're going to build structures around it or something. I mean, not that I have anything against tents, but the space <laughs> changes. Like the pictures I've seen, there is no walking room other than squeezing between these tents. Like it is no longer even a publicly passable park. I mean, these tents cover the entire area. And when people see a tent city, they, they automatically assume that they're homeless people. So there's that, yeah. too. I wish, I wish you would spend your energy more at a local planning board with all these strip malls and how they designed Central Park and the nightmare <laughs> that is kind of rural Virginia <laughs> turned suburbia right. rather than worrying about a goddamn park with a bunch of tents. I'm not worried about it. I'm saying Listen, that they were right. Let me to talk. Evict them. <laughs> let me talk. And the other thing, young man. <laughs> is what this demonstrates over time mm. is that, you know, the city governments, the state apparatus, however you want to look at this, is threatened immensely sure. by the aggregation and the congregation of people who have an issue. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is about. This isn't about keeping the parks clean. This isn't about, you know, those, I wish those damn Wall Streeters would shave and not look so hippie. I wish, I wish that, I wish that too. I hate the hippie aesthetic. <laughs> but the I idea is, you look, like this stuff and then this the, stuff? I don't like, no. I, I, I wish they were angrier. I wish they had guns. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wish, in fact, that this was a little bit more aggressive. But that's just my opinion. Sure, that's your aesthetic. The bottom line, <laughs> the bottom line is the fact that no matter what the congregation, and Peaceful is probably the more intelligent mm. is you're gonna see that the state ultimately uses violence to stop it mm -hmm. and that's really scary we saw it in Cairo we saw it in Iran we saw it in Madrid we're seeing it in the US all over the US we're no different do you right this whole idea of the democratic US and freedom yeah we could tolerate it up to a point now we're more conservative than that okay than a lot of pl those places do yeah, you I agree. do you feel like due diligence wasn't done on the part of the government in terms of getting them out there without violence? I don't think due diligence on the part of the government was done in terms of controlling the moneyed aristocracy, the banks. Completely That's different what this is about. Yeah, no, but... that is not the argument. The argument is not about tents and parks. The argument is about there is a small number of people who are choking the average working class folk. Mm -hmm into a complete convulsion mm -hmm. and to the point now where we're ready to occupy parks to make our point but okay. is that doing That's any good all right so let's <laughs> let's 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 In say that let's say that oh. everyone gets that now let's say that you know th things can move forward now and 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 things no, what leslie get, said people get that the fact and it's what leslie and david harvey really echo what leslie was saying is Having people in the street, in those public common spaces, mm -hmm. really makes a difference. The state is not stupid. Corporations are not stupid. They know that once you get them out, people forget. They go back to watching their football or playing with their little iPad or their iTouch <laughs> or their iPhone. Mm -hmm. People like to be entertained beyond the fact of what's staring them in the face. When it stares them in the face, you know, you could turn off Twitter, you could turn off your Facebook. You can frame what you're seeing. When someone's in your face poor and saying, look, the government has freaking robbed me and drained me of my life savings because they're freaking vampires, it's a little harder to ignore that. Okay, one other distinction. I know we're, we're running long here. I'll try to help you out here. I know Andy's <laughs> got to go at some point. Uh, what's stopping people from, and again, I hate to sound like I'm hating on tents, but what's stopping people from instead of setting up camps and food pantries and libraries and wireless networks, simply marching every day. What, what makes it different in that you get to set up a space where you live and redefine the space that you're in as opposed to the traditional protest? No matter how long it is, nobody would have kicked anyone out had it been traditional protests. Even if it goes on for two months, if every single day people are out there marching, they're exercising their right and I wonder that there's not some way, I, I don't see how that could be shut down as your right to assemble. However, what they're doing is something different in my eyes. They could, I mean, you, I think you're being a little naive. I mean, mm. I mean, they could, you know, be like, well, okay, you've been on this street for the past, you know, 
we gave, you need to go over to this street this time. You need to move over to this area. It's like the free zone, the free free right. zone thing. So our student aide says that, that that could have happened, that government could say you're not allowed to march here, you're not allowed to march there, and that could happen. But my well, they're point doing in that it right now with Zuccotti Park. They'll do it no matter what. But I feel like the Zuccotti Park thing and actually occupying a space overnight for two months is different than assembling and peacefully protesting. Different in kind, but that's well, all. I, I, let's, let's also remember that, and, I, and I'm going to get real de de pedantic on, on this, I guess, but the idea <laughs> is that the Sit protest, down. the constitutionality of the protest, is to, a, is to redress the arms. government. There okay. is no government entity that that they are protesting in these in these areas mm. and this is what this is kind of wh where my argument is it's that they need to they need to channel this in in the right area I agree with the protest and the idea of the protest and I agree with that they're constantly being this need to be in the face of of people to remind them what's going on but ultimately there's some change that they want to have happen and they are not redressing these issues with their government. They're they're out there protesting, and and to me it 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 starts to lose this effectiveness. And and the other, sad to say, the other part of this effectiveness is whether the media, in its incredibly short attention span, can can ever generate enough kind of we'll keep covering this until it's over. You know, right now they're they're kind of saying, all right, this story is waning. So we're going to start to move on to other things. Mm -hmm. um, whatever the next, you know, celebrity who gets in trouble is, we need to move on to that. That story I, is more important. I think part of the problem is that, you know, like, we have such, we have so little trust in our government. Like, I think I would have more, uh, more, more of an effect on things that are going on if I were to go out and join the movement rather than petition my you know, my representative, because I feel like they're so just, they're not in tune with the things that, um, you know, that I want um, mm -hmm. to have happen, that mm -hmm. it, it is more effective for me to just go out and be like, you know, screw this, I just need to be out in the streets where the people are. See, I disagree. I, I believe that if all the people who are protesting would write their congressman and say, look, I am not going to vote for you unless you start to put into action some of these things that we're talking about. Start, start looking at the corporations, ch you know, changing the tax code to, to address loopholes. Um, they, they talked about, uh, and just this past Sunday on, on, on the 60 Minutes broadcast, they talked about bills that have been introduced by a couple of congressmen and some of them who have left, left office, basically not allowing representatives to have their own um, version of insider trading. Because congressmen are, are um, re, uh, they're neglected, they're, what's the word? They're, they're exempt from any kind of insider trading laws. Mm -hmm. They are able to, whatever information they get in committees or other situations, they are able to go out and make trades in, on stock trades without having insider information laws apply to them. So things like that, you know, if, if they would say, look, we want you to vote for these types of laws, I, th I think that makes more of a difference. It's a slower kind of uh, fixing of this. But, but after all, it, it is 99% versus 1%. If everyone got, got together and voted and changed some of these issues and said, these are the types of laws that we want you to create, that's going to be the change that happens that makes a difference. We have to, we have to wrap this up. However, Leslie, I want to give you the final word. There you go. So if you can wrap up. Everything that we've said and make us all happy in the process, I'd appreciate that. But tell me what you're thinking. Wow, thanks, Tim, for giving me the giving me the final word on that. You know, I think that um, I think that uh, this whole Occupy Wall Street movement has been, I don't know, I guess you could call it an existential revolution. At least that's how I've how I've approached the idea for myself. Is you know, in what ways can I change my own life? Right, like I'm not down there living in the in, in the park, but whenever I'm in the area, I take food down and I share a meal with someone, and I sit down and I talk to them about, okay, what is it, what is it that you're here for? Why why are you participating in this movement? And then how do you take that back and make it make a difference and have an effect in your day to day life, right? Because on on a certain level, 
you know, it's, it's all rhetoric and, you know, government corporations and all this kind of business. But on another level, it's something that you can do in your life, like, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I guess that's where the real revolution actually happens. Well, I agree. The existential revolution, I like that. I do, too. Nice. All right. Oh, wait, there and DSM. Oh, wait, there and DSM. For <laughs> 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 life. Nice touch. All right, thanks, everybody, for watching. Take care. We'll see you all Thank later. You.